Where do we come from? For centuries, the greatest question in the history of man had no scientific answer. Then, the first evidence of a human ancestor started a scientific revolution. This is the story of the quest to find the origins of the human race. It spanned a century and a half of obsessive searching and would make or break the careers of some of the greatest scientists in the field. For the lucky few, chance discoveries opened a window on the hidden world of our ancestors. From the tiniest fragments of the past, the full story was slowly pieced together. Spanning 300,000 generations, over three million years, it is the story of our progress from ape to man. The search for the origins of humanity is a story of bones and the tales they tell. The first chapter began here, 40,000 years in the future, at the entrance to this cave. With the discovery of this man. <laughs> The year was 1856, and the cave lies in what is now the Neander Valley in Germany. Workmen were digging for limestone, a vital ingredient in the local chemical industry. It lay under a layer of rock and soil. The men were paid a few pence a day to remove the surface layer, and everything was thrown away. Then, a spade hit something that didn't sound like a rock. The shape looked like the top of a skull, and thinking it might be a murder victim, they stopped work to show the foreman. Yeah. It was interesting, but he'd seen this kind of thing before and was happy to send it the way of all the other bits of bone they'd found, to be smashed up with the rocks. Then something made him change his mind. He knew a local school teacher who might be interested to see it, and the skull got a reprieve. What he could never have imagined was that the skull was seeing the light of day for the first time in more than 40,000 years. In Western Europe, 400 centuries before Christ, the original owner of the skull was a living, breathing being, a hunter, a tribal leader, a father of children, and a member of the most successful species on the European continent at the time, Neanderthal man. Forty thousand years later, a school teacher, Johann Fulrot, got the chance to see the skull for the first time. Hello, Munier. Hello. Hello. A keen amateur geologist and former anatomy student, Fulrot had no idea if he'd come on a wild goose chase. 
Oh, interessant. The moment he saw the skull, he knew instinctively that this was something extraordinary. It looked fossilized, which would make it thousands of years old, and it was clearly not an animal. But neither was it from a normal, modern human being. This particular skull is the skull of Neanderthal, and it, uh, it's big. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 this individual lived around 50,000 years ago. And by that time, Neanderthals had developed a brain that was as large, and in some cases, larger than the modern human brain. You notice that it's rather long and low. And it's almost as if you grab the front of a human face and pull it out. You also have this big protruding nose. And in fact, look how large that nose is. So they would have looked different for, for, from modern humans if you actually saw one with the flesh on it. Over 300 Neanderthal remains have been found from Europe to the Middle East. They all tell the same story of a short, powerful physique, perfectly evolved for the world they lived in. A tough place. Europe was in the early stages of the last Great Ice Age. Within a few centuries, this land was under a glacier half a mile thick. At this time, the climate was fluctuating quite extremely. And we do know that they survived some of the major cold snaps, the major uh, glacial advances. The only way to support advanced life here was with a high-protein meat diet, and that meant learning to be a good hunter or starve. What we do know from the skeletons, that Neanderthals were very robust, they were very strong, but they also had this huge brain. The tools found with Neanderthal suggest they developed sophisticated stone technology. Their weapons were the tools of their survival and needed to be maintained. If a spear failed at the critical moment, the hunt would fail. Neanderthal males seemed to have supported loose family groups of up to a dozen. This hunting trip had already taken three days and covered 10 miles with no sign of any prey. Then they found animal droppings. Neanderthal nasal cavities are unique among hominids, suggesting a highly evolved sense of smell, and they recognized the scent of red deer. Rubbing the droppings on their skin helped to disguise their approach, if they could catch up with the deer. They'd had to range further in recent months to find a kill. Red deer numbers had fallen rapidly, and they had no idea why. What they didn't know was that they had competition. Competition that would one day drive them to extinction. Victorian scientist Johann Fuhrroth held the evidence of an unknown ancient species. Wo habt ihr das gefunden? Wir haben es dort gefunden. Und was war da sonst noch? Uh, vielleicht noch ein Bein. Uh, zeig mir bitte. It's hard even to guess what the creature was without more evidence. Nur noch diesen Bein. And they hadn't got much. Oh, und wo ist der Rest? Wir haben sie weggeschmissen. Es weggeschmissen. Ja. Wenn ihr jetzt noch was findet, schmeißt bitte gar nichts weg. Haltet es für mich. Ja, meine. Ich nehme jetzt erstmal diese zwei mit. Gut. Danke. Fuhrrott gave the bones to more qualified scientists. But even when more pieces emerged from the same cave, they completely failed to identify them. 
Opinions varied widely, from a barbarian who'd fought the Roman legions to a lost Russian Cossack, even the victim of some unknown congenital deformity. But a new idea began to take center stage. Fulrot himself suggested Neanderthal might be an early ancestor of modern man. To many Victorians, this seemed the most absurd notion of all. Then, in 1859, just three years after the bones were found, the notion suddenly caught on. Charles Darwin published his groundbreaking work, The Origin of Species. He suggested that all living things had descended from earlier, simpler forms by the process of evolution. And if it was true for every living thing on Earth, then that had to include us. In 1859, Darwin publishes The Origin of Species. And a lot of people think that this book was, was paid attention to, but it wasn't. Most people couldn't care a jot about whether, whether a fish evolved into an amphibian. No one cared. The big question, the question that everybody wanted to know is, where did we come from? And it's in the 1850s and 60s that science steps to the plate and says, I'm going to give you the answer. And boy, did they give us an answer. If humans had evolved from a simpler form, the implication to the scientific mind was obvious and disturbing. Humans could only have descended from apes. The impact on the Victorian psyche was profound. Many believed the theory of evolution made them little more than animals. Darwin stayed away from that question. He knew he was going to get into trouble. He writes to friends and says, uh-uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Far too controversial. And it's up to other people, new scientists, a younger generation of scientists, coming on in the 1850s and 60s, seeing an opening, seeing that they could make a career if they were to answer this question, where do humans come from? Inspired by the Neanderthal bones, evolution became the hottest topic of the age. But it would stay little more than a theory without more evidence. Scientific attention turned to an ancestor that would link us to the apes. An ape man, a missing link, and they would go to the ends of the earth to find it. In the late 1800s, the world of science had become obsessed with the idea of a missing link between apes and man. And German scientist Johann Fuhlroth believed Neanderthal man was that link. Neanderthal seems so promising when it's first presented. It seems like it's going to be the answer. But on closer inspection, it starts to fall apart. Most importantly, the key fossils just seem to be too much like humans. Neanderthal, at best, is a man with some ape qualities. Traveling back in time, our Neanderthal stood just 3,000 generations behind us at around 40,000 years ago. To find a true missing link meant going further back in time to something more ape-like. The question was, how much ape and how much man would it be? I think the idea of a missing link came from a, a very simple view of evolution. And it's not surprising it was simple because, of course, these ideas were in their infancy. But people had this idea of fixed types. There were humans and there were apes and an evolutionary transition between those two types would somehow combine the features of both types. There was no real conception that evolution could operate over vast periods of time um, and there could be complex mixtures of characteristics. So people were looking for something essentially that would be halfway between a living human and a living ape. 